pause is to just define it once uh, for the interest of those who are still figuring out what is menopause beyond fla hot flashes. So scientifically, it's when women stop having their periods and even more set of hormones take over their lives, leading to many psychological and physiological changes. Um, it's an interesting period for sure. So let's get into this conversation and see where are we on things and how much of this conversation are we really starting out with? Are we starting enough conversations? So maybe I will start um, with you, Lara, since you've given me a cue from your last um, uh, you know, few questions for the men. But I'm going to put the question to you. The last time we were chatting, we talked about your mom, your sister, and how this was a, this was a conversation. But your household is slightly different, right? Girls just take over. Where are you on those conversations? And how do you encourage others to literally embrace that conversation from hap uh, by happening? Sure. So, Shelly, quickly to put into context for people that were not here the last time round, I come from a family where my grandmother is one of six sisters. My mother is one of three sisters. We're three sisters, and me and all my, both my sisters all have daughters. So, <laughs> um, I said this the last time, I truly believe that our purpose in life, my purpose on this planet, my family's purpose on this planet is to take, to take womanhood and raise these really strong, opinionated Amazonian women. Um, but that said and done, I think for me, Shelley, you know, I grew up in a household where I'm the youngest of three. So my father, bless him, was a man who was going through a wife who was going through menopause and his youngest daughter who had just started getting her period. So he's been through the entire gamut of everything. You know, and um, the conversations in our house, like Vivek said, you know, that they, the girls don't really have very many filters. And I grew up in a household where, because we were never dictated to the fact that, Acha, you know, a ghar mein ladka hai, aise baat nahi karni chahiye, aise kapde nahi pehne chahiye. We were given that freedom growing up also in the armed forces to really just pursue and follow through with anything that we wanted to. The conversations in our home were very, very normalized conversations. So there was no topic that was taboo. You know, it didn't matter whether it revolved around your period, whether it revolved around menopause, whether it revolved around reproductive rights or, you know, just the whole entire process. And um, so I think for me, I thankfully enough grew up in a very empowered household. And as I got older and came out into the world, I couldn't understand why there was this need to hide things, share things in whispers, you know, put things under the carpet, shouldn't be talked about, shouldn't be mentioned. And it increasingly infuriated me when I entered the entertainment industry because there was even more so a suppression on any kind of expression of any of these topics, you know. And um, I think we've all come a really long way from that. And I just also want to quickly add over here that you know, menopause is not something that lasts for a woman for three years, five years, you know, or anything like that. Now I'm speaking from experience. Menopause can take you through almost two decades of your life, yeah. you know, if, sometimes also if you're lucky, <laughs> you know. But it's just that we need to understand that, that it's not something that either a woman or a man in her life or the family around them have to deal with. You know? So I think that awareness needs to be also there. Wherein comes in the sensitivity? And I think that's what we're talking about here today. Is about being sensitive to this, not just the next chapter, this wonderful chapter in a woman's life. You know, there's so many things to unpack in, the, in, in, in that experience that you've shared, including this awareness and self-awareness. So, Doc, I'll come to you. Um, Dr. Sheriar, talk to us about whether women that you meet uh, who are going through their menopause are even aware that they are, and are they willing to embrace the changes? Uh, because we do talk about awareness as if, you know, the media puts one headline and the world gets to know, and that's not the story. Um, many of our mothers still don't know the term, don't understand its nuances. So perhaps your experiences um, with the women that you meet. So first I'm, first I'm going to take off from what Lara and you just said. One of my favorite quotes is Anasuya Sen Gupta who said, 
too many women in too many countries speaking the same language of silence. It just came to me. Yeah. I'm also going to share some very interesting statistic I came across a few months ago. For the first time in human history, there are more grandparents in the world than grandchildren. Human populations are getting older. We are going to spend more and more of our life after a certain age. And let's face it, people are having fewer children. So my personal uh, involvement started from the fact that being in practice for three decades, the women you look after stay with you. A gynecologist, and I'm so happy that uh, Lara's family is just all women because <laughs> we gynecologists love the fact that we look after women and don't have to look after men. <laughs> Uh, those women are now coming to me in their 40s, 50s and 60s. They stay with you and they are coming to me with their issues of the midlife. Yeah. Now, when you look at these issues of the midlife, you realize that every woman does it differently and sometimes doesn't even know what she's doing. There was a study from Engender Health in the UK which said that 65% uh, of women in the menopause transition, and I think this is an underestimate, will have some symptoms. Of these, about 40% will be quite severe, and 10% it would be completely disruptive. Right? That's the kind of half of your population is going to go through this. 65% of them are going to go through some symptoms, and 10% of that half of the world's population are going through go, go through distressing symptoms, right? Now the problem is sometimes these symptoms go unrecognized. So to answer your question, I would have to start with the term perimenopause. Menopause event, last period, momentary, 12 years no period, uh, 12 months no periods, you're menopausal. But this starts at least six years before, and that's the confusion. A woman comes to me and says, I have menstrual disturbances, but I, am, I know what's happening. I'm getting my hot flushes, but I still menstruate. I'm getting all these mood issues, but I'm menstruating. And finally, of course, you know, menopause, if there's one term I use for menopause, it's dryness. Dryness, dryness, dryness. I'm menstruating. So that's the perimenopause. Now, when, when a woman comes to a doctor, there is another angle to it. Uh, I remember Oprah Winfrey once saying that I went to five specialist doctors and none of them told me I was menopausing. Oprah Winfrey, the best doctors in the US. Doctors see things from their perspective. You go to them with flushes and palpitations, they'll check out your heart. The dermatologist will do the skin, the psychiatrist will say you're depressed. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Again, we have a house in Lonavla. My contractor comes to me a few months ago and says, my wife had a cardiac episode and we've done all the investigations and I don't know what we're going to do. And I said, okay, how old is she? 47. Is she getting a period? She had a hysterectomy a few months ago. That poor woman was having a hot flush in the middle of the night and everyone thought she was having a cardiac arrest. Okay, so this is where things are getting better. They're getting better because information is out there. The information has to be better. The information shouldn't be something that puts fear, but puts confidence. You know, I want to briefly step. ask you something because you gave the example of opera, right? We're talking about the developed market. We're talking about somebody who's extremely confident, etc. Do you think that there is a tendency among doctors, as it is in our conditioning, to mask that they're going through menopause because there's also a fear that's on the other side? Just curious. So. So right, now, thanks to the book, we've been interacting with a lot of women and we hear so many stories from women. Medicine is all about stories. Suchitra and me hear stories every day. Yes. So our experience is not one woman's but a thousand women's. A woman told me she went to a doctor with classic menopausal symptoms. Wonderful doctor, she loved him, he delivered her babies and she says, when I told him, you know what he did doc? He stood up, he shut my file and he says, this is going to last for the next two or three years. Don't worry, it's going to be gone. When you take care of this woman, and this is something Suchitra and me were just conversing, you need to give time, you need to listen, you need to counsel, and unfortunately, our model of medicine has always been very reactive. We fix things. I'm sorry, you're not supposed to be just fixing things. You're supposed to be listening, 
hearing and 50% of problems are gone and the remaining 50% today, I must say this here, and this is what you've got to convey because this is a great group. This is the group which is going to put things out there. Medical therapy is evidence-based to help that individual woman who needs it. This misconception women have the moment I say hormones and they panic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There are cases which is this is the treatment of choice and you should be open to it. But what you have to do is give them the tools to go and demand the care that they deserve. There's one line I would like to say about hormones is please understand hormone therapy is researched whether it's the pill or whether it's hormone therapy, no medication in the history of mankind has been researched as much. Personally, I always tell the patient, this is the safest thing for you. Hormones are safe. Some women are dangerous. So we just have to find out who, the, who shouldn't be taking it and everyone else, if they need it, can take them very safely. Okay, Do Dr. Pandit, um, you know, part of what we all are discussing here also puts the onus of being self-aware raising your hand, making that call to a doctor on the women going through this. And that will happen when they're more and more aware of the symptoms. So first part of my question is, do you really feel as a doc that women are even getting aware? And second part of it is that what is it that you tell them to watch out for in order for them to raise that mild alarm to say, okay, let me just go meet somebody and get this going on a, on a journey that will solve it or guide me. Right. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, as uh, you know, Dr. Nozer rightly pointed out, women are not as aware of what they're going through simply because they don't want to accept that they have a problem. Now, as you know, you mentioned figures that, you know, the Indian figures, some of them mentioned that 80% of women go through the menopause and probably, you know, it's just mild or moderate symptoms. But there are those 10 to 12% who are very severe and probably they will come up. But what about the remaining? Why are they suffering in silence? So, you know, some of the things like, you know, hot flushes, night sweats, simple thing like falling of hair, irritability, confusions, you know, the typical mind fog that women talk about, and then backaches. And some of them are, you know, like having vaginal dryness, genital urinary symptoms. They will talk about the irregular menses, but then they don't want to come forward. And if they ignore these symptoms, these can get more severe. And the severe ones they need to know about is, you know, these hot flushes and night sweats can become so severe, they affect your sleep patterns. And if your sleep patterns are affected, you are more depressed, your quality of work suffers. Whether you're a homemaker or whether, you know, you're working somewhere, both the things, the quality of life quotient is very, very important. And, uh, you know, the long-term symptoms women need to know. If you suffer for a long time, your cardiac, your heart is not going to be with you. One misconception I'd like to think, tell you that most of the people tend to think women don't get heart attacks. It's only the men who get it. But remember, at 48, 49, 50, our hormones, our estrogen has fallen down and we are as predisposed to cardiac events as men are. So therefore, and there's also a redistribution of abdominal fat because, you know, the lipid-friendly, we call lipids, you know, it's the fats. So the heart-friendly fats go down and the unfriendly ones start going up. And because of the redistribution of the fat, women also tend to put on a lot of weight around the be belly. The metabolism reduces unless you're really, you know, someone like Lara Dutta who's into, you know, a lot of physical activity. And today you're seeing a lot more people doing that. But unless they learn that, you know, they will have long-term consequences in osteoporosis. You know, we tend to think osteoporosis is a silent killer. The bones get brittle and because of the vasomotor symptoms, the incidence of falls, the impact of the falls, the incidence of fractures goes high. So these are the long-term problems. And remember, breast cancer is something, you know, women fear. But in the fifth and the sixth decade of life, that's the time it's detected, the, you know, the most. So prevention Nobody can prevent breast cancer, but at least you can diagnose it much more earlier. I mean, we're not trying to get medical, but you know, these are some of the realities. And Alzheimer's, you know, nobody knows really what causes it. But we definitely know that when you're in the postmenopausal phase, more women get into it. So activity-wise, you know, mental activity, physical activity, all these things women need to know. So change of your 
lifestyles. Eating well, you know, it's easy to say eat well, but what is eating well? A balanced diet, good carbs, good amount of proteins, less of fats, eat at the right time. You know, we tend to, Indian women or Indian families tend to eat late at night, 10 o'clock, 10.30 when the husband comes, and then, you know, she'll just clear up, and then they are in bed watching telly. So <clears throat> that is one of the worst exercises one can do is getting into bed soon after. So eat in time, drink plenty of fluids, have lots of fruits, nuts. And you know, today there are so many veggies around which are different. You know, you can have the salads, you can have whatever, but get onto a good diet, exercise well, walk well, think positive, sleep well. I think that's so important and have that health consciousness. So talk about your symptoms, don't, don't confine it to yourself and don't suffer silently, we're all there. You know, we as doctors are there, you know, we as influencers are there to tell women, speak up, speak up. Yeah. And that's what they have to do.